We'll start today's podcast with Tales from the Couch. You didn't know on Wednesday because we did the QB NFL stuff um, with the NBA player comp, which honestly, I could do a whole nother segment on it. We got some other great ones. Uh, maybe I'll share some of those with you. Uh, last night was a light, light slate, light slate, but we had a great game in Denver Portland. So let me start there. And then there's a couple other things that I'll get to. We'll keep it moving here. 15 lead changes in the last 633 of a Denver win at Portland. So it's 15 lead changes in the last second half of the fourth quarter. Dame's been back for two games. He looked like prime Dame last night. 40 and 12, 12 assists, 9 to 17 from three, and big Dame threes. Like that three where you think you have it covered on the high screen. It's not really even a high. It's like a little side screen action. And you're like, okay, I don't have to close out to 30 feet up. The shot's up in the air, and it went in again. That's the lethal Dame where there's just – you get so annoyed because you go, I have to work this hard, this far away from the basket. I have to anticipate around the screen this far away, seriously. And then if you start really cheating up like that, then you're going to get burned off of something else. But Dame would just be like, oh, you waited. Oh, you were late. little hesitation. I'm going to dial it back up from here. So it looked like he hit the game winner with 9.1 seconds left. And then back the other way, Jamal Murray hits one with 0.9 seconds left game blouses. So a couple of things on Jamal Murray. Watching him different points, You know the numbers are pretty good in November. Not deep enough nearly in December here. Coming back from a significant injury, I just like the way he's been moving. And I thought last night was like, hey, you know what? This is happening. And I know he's been putting up some numbers that look pretty good, but I think the growth towards him running around and looking like a good player again, like we're going to be there. It's going to work out. It's going to be fine. Uh, There was also a moment last night too where I was watching the 10 guys on the floor. It was Pope, Murray, Gordon, Jokic, um, Bones, that's without Michael Porter Jr. out there. And then on the other side, it's Nurk, it's Grant, it's Hart, it's Simons, it's Dame. And I'm going, these are two teams that you wouldn't exactly put in like the absolute contender level. And I know some Denver fans would say, yes, we are. Mm, I think it's still a little fringy. But think about those 10 guys to close out a game. We're, we're not talking about two of the best teams in the West. Just the amount of talent that we have in this league. It was just something I was thinking about. Um, there was one play here in particular that was my favorite because I had mentioned before it was that Detroit-Denver game, and there's one person specifically that hit me up about what was so great about the thing you were talking about, and I feel like I let him down. I don't even know why I'm telling the story, but there was this pre-switching that Denver was doing on one side because Detroit had changed who was defending Jamal Murray. They put knocks on Murray because they were like, if we're going to do these murray Jokic s- switches, Let's have more size going into the switch for Jokic. So then Denver was trying to do something to kind of get out of that. And then sometimes I don't even care because it's Jokic. Who, by the way, no one is better at the, I guess I'll just fucking shoot it play, than Nikola Jokic. He is, I've never seen, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like it. Where he'll just be like, "Ah, I'm dangling, dangling. All right, whatever. I guess I'll just shoot a three. Goes in. All that stuff around the baseline. Cutter, cutter, where are you? Fake pass up, fake spin, turn around. Uh, I guess I'll just take this 14-foot jumper, and then it goes in. He leads the league, and I guess I'll just shoot at shots or his efficiency. And so last night, they were running a very simple switch where they were trying to get Jokic switched with Murray's guy, and then Murray could go at Nurkic. And Murray's going to have moments, even if it feels like the ball should always be with Jokic. Uh, You know, he's just that special. God, he is so much fun to watch. But Murray was like, no, I want to turn. You know, and that's how basketball works, okay? Especially when you're really good. You're like, I know I want to turn at all this. And Nurkic was like, got switched on a Murray, but then it wasn't like any kind of definitive move. They didn't attack it right away. So Nurkic is like, you know what? Let me just go back. So he goes back to Jokic. Jokic ends up with the basketball. Nurkic blocks the shot. It doesn't happen enough in the NBA where somebody tries to just look at the scenario and goes, wait a minute, if they're not completely like pushing the pace here and they're bringing it back out, why don't I just go back to the original guy, even though you get the switch? And sometimes I swear to God, some of these NBA switches, like I'll be like, why did you want that switch? Or then you got the switch that you wanted, and then you didn't do anything with it. It's just very weird. It, it happens. And granted, it's basically what basketball is. So there's going to be plenty of possessions that don't make a ton of sense. Why am I a little hesitant on Denver as the full-blown um, real West contender that could get out? Like I always ask this question, right? 
if Denver won the West, would I be surprised? Right now, the answer is yes. And I know Porter Jr. coming back adds their depth and their offense. And Gordon's been better for them again this year. He's somebody who I always feel like the new fan base that would get him. And granted, he's only left one team in Orlando. But you're always like, I just wish it was a little bit more. I've liked what he's done this year. However, their defense, they're fourth on offense. They're 26th on defense. That's down there with Utah 24th and then teams like Orlando, Houston, Detroit, and San Antonio. That's not good. Let's look back historically. They just don't play defense well enough. 21st, or excuse me, 21-22, uh, 15th in defense. 2021, 11th. 19-20, 16th. 18-19. We're going back a ways here. They were 10th in defensive efficiency. It's actually getting worse. Denver is the four seed today since a four and three start, now eleven and seven. Denver, the eight seed as of this morning, started ten and four, three and eight the rest of the way. Uh, but they did go two and six without Dame. He's been back two games. Miami, they're a 10 seed. They beat the Clippers last night. This is going to be a lot quicker. There feels like 12 teams in the East that are battling for the top 10. Washington's lost four in a row. They're in that group. Uh Beal's hamstring could be out. Hoping to get him back during this next road trip. Could be next week. And then you've got Chicago, who I have this note too. Chicago started last year 39-21, and 21, and since then with the playoffs, and this note is from a couple days ago, so I could be off a game, 17-33. and 33. That's with the playoffs. It just seems crazy that, that Chicago team, where I think we all kind of like a couple of those pieces, that they could be out of this whole thing. And it's kind of how they've been trending now for a good chunk of the second half of last year and then into this year. My hesitation on Miami and one of the most impressive coaching jobs I've seen in recent history with them being a one seed last year is I still feel like the talent standpoint, there's kind of a drop off. We know who their big three guys are. Bam has been even better. Butler's missed 10 games. But God, when he closes out, what he did to Boston last week, what he did last night against the Clippers, he just feels like, and I, maybe it's, he just hasn't played enough because he's missed the games, but. Maybe the stats are misleading, but Butler finds a way to close. So even though we don't put him in that tier one group when he's closing, and I push back on it even when they were in the NBA Finals because it turns into who's the best player on the other team that's playing in it. Hey, is Butler this? Is he that? No, he's not top five. He's none of those things. But damn, can he close a game out? He just can. Uh, and he's got the personality for it too. And his shooting numbers have been incredible. We're talking like career high shooting numbers, career high assist stuff. But I feel after Lowry, who's held up better, um, as far as playing games this year, Bam, who's held up, and we've already talked about Butler missing those. You know, a lot falls onto Hero a little bit. Hero's numbers still look pretty good, and I love the development of some of these other pieces around him. But when you're starting to compare Miami's roster with the other rosters that you're, we're talking about coming out of the East, not a 10 seed. I don't know that it holds up. I just don't. And that's why I was so fascinated and impressed with what they actually did last year with that roster. Speaking of Boston, that beat down of Phoenix. If you didn't know, now you know, right? I, I got one point. I was like, is this going to be 100 to 50? <laughs> like against Phoenix. Okay. <laughs> against Phoenix. Spare me that Chris Paul just came back, jokes. I get it. Um, not true, by the way. The best thing about Boston is they've got two of these top 11 scores. Bill did a good job going back to the podcast we did together on Tuesday. The combined scoring, like the history that we're seeing right now with Jalen Brown and Tatum and that they can play together. They can play without each other. And the defensive concerns for them that they had, not even going back that far, like they felt like a middle-of-the-pack team defensively, which was crazy because of the record. Well, they're now ninth and they're fourth in defense in their last 10 games. And we'll keep Noticing this as I think we'll see a continuation of some of the top players sitting out more games. It's been pretty good so far. I skipped right over the Clippers. Yes, I did. Sorry. I don't know what to do with that team. I don't know what to do with them. I watched the game against Charlotte. It's great Kawhi hit the game winner. He got cooked by Terry Rozier like three times in a row in the fourth quarter. All right? Not in a row, but three during those closing moments. I don't know what to do with that team. I'm not going to write them off. I'm also not going to tell you they're awesome and that that's still the team to beat. And I think that's fair. But yeah, I did skip over them a little bit. But back to Boston, the anti-Paul George Kawhi pairing uh, will look at Boston and how often their two top guys are playing because I think these guys are on a mission this season and it's going to be something that that keeps building their record in some of those numbers. All right, the last game here, I did watch start to finish Houston-San Antonio. <laughs> 
I'm just interested in what Houston might be. Uh, San Antonio won this one. Keldon Johnson, you know, there's some numbers out there. You know, I try to warn people about this all the time, like the fake numbers. They're like, all right, yeah, like, okay, this guy's scoring went up. All right, well, he just took more shots. He's not, he's not better. Um, the worst team has to have a leading scorer rule. Uh, Devin Vassell is actually technically the leading scorer, I think, going into last night. I didn't check it again this morning because he was right there with Keldon Johnson the last week. I just really like Keldon Johnson. I think he's terrific. Is he a one? No. <laughs> I don't think he is. Although some of these developmental stories over the past few years, like even Jokic, I'm like, man, what a nice little player that guy is. Or a big player. It's like, no, nope, now he's going to win back-to-back MVPs. Did not see that happening. So who knows? You know, ceilings for no one is what I should say. I like Keldon. Sohan was out last night. And then there's the Houston part of this. All right. I have noticed at times where, I mean, this is the Jalen Green show. And that's fine. He's 20 years old. You took him where you took him in the draft. Um, It's a lot of bad offense. That's okay. They're a young team. But young teams, when you have like seven guys that are worried about who they're going to be in the NBA at the same time, does not exactly translate to team ball that often. And I really blame them. I mean, that's the psychology of the NBA player. If there was some sort of story arc, you would go, young guy, top pick, worried about shoe deal, cash, and extension, and buckets. And then it's like year seven. It's like, hey, wait, (laughs) I've gotten a ton of money in a bunch of buckets. I'm tired of being a seven seed. Uh, Houston takes Jabari Smith. So now you've got Jabari, you've got Jalen, you've got Shingoon, Alpi, you've got Porter Jr. who's going to get his buckets. You've got Kenny Martin Jr. who wants his shine. Tara Eason, who you don't have to run any plays for, and he comes right in and just impacts the game. Uh, where I've been impressed with Tari, I, I like him, even though out of LSU, I couldn't believe he got some of the calls. And it was a little bit of my Al Thornton rule there where I'd watch a player and go, I don't know if any of this stuff's really going to work in the NBA, but his physical part, it's almost just like send him into the scorer's table and then let him go in and see what happens. So I think that's been a positive. So there's a lot of things going on here with Houston. But the thing that I think is most concerning, because all the mistakes that they make as a young team, you're just like, okay, whatever. Like, this isn't that big of a deal. It's, it's to be expected. But I'd mentioned during a Toronto game where I was watching Jabari Smith set screens and then he would roll or he'd move or he'd pop and then nobody would give him the ball. And I was like, all right, that's, that's not great. Like you got to reward guys at some point. Everybody wants to touch the basketball. So let's dig into some numbers because I've noticed it a few other times too, which part. And it's just, again, this isn't some huge flaw, some massive problem. And, and Jabari had a nice night last night. And I wonder if they're going to try to maybe separate him and Jalen a little bit because you know, there was a there was a possession against the Sixers where Jabari was wide open in the corner to the left and Jalen gave it to him. Jabari misses. Same thing happened again. Jabari's wide open. He's a terrific shooter. And Jalen Green was almost like, now nah, you already had your turn. Like, I'm going to go and do something. So that was the Sixers game. I noticed some ignored roles in other games where you're like, you guys just don't even look for him. And then last night there was an, a play where Jalen was kind of coming on a curl from the box. He was kind of coming from the baseline and he was curling around. Jabari was the break of the left side, three-point line break. And you're going, oh, okay, well, he could get it to Jabari. And then Jalen reset and then decided to take a long two against two defenders. Jalen Green at this point is uh, the quarterback who, when he's freaked out, runs. And for him, running is, I'm just going to drive on everybody because he's also really good at it. I don't know how many guys get off the floor as quickly and as powerful as, as Jalen Green does. So all of that stuff is still good. I'm not off of Jalen Green or anything. It's just, it's just not a lot of fun if you're one of the other guys watching one of the other guys go for his. Now, Shingun, nobody's going to be running into the post here, but he might have more offensive moves than anyone on this basketball team, but he's an afterthought. He might be like the fourth or fifth option. I mean, Eric Gordon's not going to not score anymore, and you can see him trying to do grown-up things, but he's also like, I'm not going to get zero points tonight. So when I looked at it, I was like, does anything back up what I'm seeing here? The numbers do. Houston runs the fourth most pick and rolls. They have the fourth worst points per possession on those pick and rolls. They have the second lowest number of total passes in each game. Only Oklahoma City has less. They're the fourth worst in assist points created. It gets worse. 
touches, just touches how many times the ball touched by the next guy. They're last. And it's not just like bad. It's like 90 less than the top teams. Um, <laughs> the point, the, the seconds per touch is like three and a half seconds per touch, which is way beyond every other team in the NBA. Um, they have the most dribbles per possession of any of the players. Uh, they have the least amount of front court touches. Just everything that you see, all the numbers back up. It's just, I'm going to do my thing. And again, it's a young team. If I were doing a Houston-San Antonio draft, you know, I might still take Jalen Green too. You might just, based on the prospect of who Jabari Smith is, you might, might go one, two right there with those two guys. Maybe Keldon's three. Maybe you like him more. Maybe he's two. Maybe you think he's one. I'm not sure that I'm there, even though starting this whole thing with really liking him. Uh, Houston would probably have four of the five guys that you would take between these two teams if you just drafted the rosters. So it's not some, I can't believe this is happening. I can totally believe it's happening, but it is happening. And at times, if you're the guy in the Rockets without the basketball, it's not a great hang. We'll do a little stats to impress other people. We rebranded that. I like to keep track of this, and this is a little bit into the Shingun post-touch thing because it's kind of funny. Yusuf Nurkic leads the NBA, and this number was going into Tuesday. So I looked these up a couple days ago, so don't freak out if it's off by a tenth. Uh, Yusuf leads the NBA in post-ups 5.4 per game. In 2014, Al Jefferson led the NBA in post-up per game with 20. 29 players in the 13-14 season posted up more times per game than Yusuf does this year. Again, is the NBA league leader in post-ups. Here's one for you. Um, 47 players. This is going back a couple of days again. 47 players are shooting 40% from three. Last year, it was 30. I do keep track of field goal attempts per game, thinking more and more guys are taking 20 or more shots per game. It's the same as last year, 12. 12 guys are shooting at 20 times. 20 is a lot of shots. That used to be that number. It's like, man, that guy takes 20 shots a game. And that number has grown, but it's the same as last year. Phoenix's offense, the most efficient offensive team from that Phoenix, seven seconds or left, uh, less era, 2007 Suns, 112.9 points per possession, per 100 possessions, excuse me, per possession would be a lot. That is the average offensive rating of the NBA today, which is number one all time. So this is the most efficient offensive season we've seen in NBA history. And this is a trend that's been going on now for a while. Um, basically, the entire league's average is playing to the same offensive efficiency number as the prime 2007 Phoenix Suns. The Suns' pace that year in 2007 would rank 28th in pace today. So there you go. Share those with your friends this weekend.